I'm continuing to test the uh, hack CPU, and so I wrote some more assembly to test uh, memory access. First few lines here load up a variable. First of all, uh, setting the D register to zero, and then subtracting one from the D register and putting it into the X memory location, which will put a uh, FF, uh, which is minus one, into that location, basically turning on all the bits. And then these next few lines of code here uh, reference the X variable, puts the address of it uh, into the A register, and then um, I set the, the D register to that value. And then I write the D register into this memory location 24577. And the significance of that is that that is the first byte that is available after video memory. My intention is to hook up just a reg 16 component at this register so that I can capture whatever is being written to it and display it in a, on an LED. So then the variable is inverted, and that's what that's what happens at this line of code, and it's, the value is stuck back in at the uh, X memory location. And then I simply just loop. And so this should have the effect of blinking all of the bits at this memory location off and on uh, as fast as the CPU can, can execute this code. The other thing I did is wrote a quick Python application that would take the hack assembly language file and convert it into a ROM file format that the uh, Logisim program could read in order to load into ROM more, more easily. And so when you run the assembler, you get a file that looks like this, which is basically uh, ASCII encoded binary for each instruction. But the Logisim ROM component needs a file that looks like this. It, it actually accepts a bunch of different file formats, but this is the one that I picked. Uh, it basically encodes each instruction into a four-digit hexadecimal number delimited by spaces, and I think there has to be 16 per line, and then this little header that tells the component what format it's in. Uh, and so I wrote a, a little, uh, I'm on Windows, so I wrote a little bat program that runs the assembler and then runs the little Python script to produce the ROM. So here is the simulation of the hack CPU, and it, it looks a little different than the last uh, testing video that I showed because uh, I was in the middle of debugging it, and so I'm, I'm sort of going... Yeah, I, I, I started to capture this information as I was doing it, and I really got stumped, and so I had you know hours and hours of footage and decided to just stop and really focus on trying to debug this issue. So now I'm going back and sort of retracing my steps to document what I found and what I did. Uh, and so I'm gonna explain some of the additions that are that you see on here. Fundamentally, the CPU hasn't changed from the, the prior videos. First thing to do is to load the ROM and you can load the image here. And so here's the ROM file uh, of the process that I just showed you to load in. And then let's just observe what, what should happen. And I'll talk about these extra components. So this, uh, these, these uh, components down here are really nothing more than an attempt to hook up a register to hold at uh, memory location 24577 the result of the inverted uh, contents. And so that way I can hook one or more of the bits up to some LED so that I can see the effect of the blinking. Uh, and so there's some um, control circuitry to load this whenever that address appears on the address bus and the right symbol appears. So that's what this is doing. And um, yeah, so the data value coming from memory, you know, gets loaded into the register whenever the load circuitry indicates that the right address has been hit. And then on the output side, I just hook up one bit to this LED. There are several other bits hooked up I'll talk about in a second, but this one bit uh, right here from the register is going to, I think, C, let's see, yeah, segment C, 
which is this segment right here. And so if this code is, you know, if everything is working correctly, what we should see is this segment blink uh, on and off at a, at a regular interval. The other thing that I did was uh, as part of the troubleshooting process, I really needed to see what the inputs to the CPU were and what the outputs from the CPU are as each one of the instructions are stepped through. And so that's what I attempted to do with these indicators and these muxes. Uh, what I can do is I can flip a switch that will route the either the output of the CPU to both of these or will route the input of the CPU to both of these displays. Uh, and I did it that way because even though I have a lot of LEDs on my FPGA board, I don't have enough to show both uh, values, or really all four values from the CPU simultaneously. So this was kind of the quickest, quickest and easiest way I could come up with to make that happen. So again, these do not impact the operation of the CPU in any way. The other thing that's new and different, which does affect the value of the CPU or, or the operation of the CPU, as it turns out, um, although I would expect it not to, more on that in a bit. But this block here uh, enables me to control the clock either manually or to, to just allow it to free run so that I can step the clock by clicking a button, causing the CPU to cycle one instruction at a time. And it may seem at first glance uh, that that's just a simple thing to do. You just hook up a switch to the clock. Uh, it's not quite that simple because... Switches can bounce, and clocks need to be very carefully timed on an FPGA. Otherwise, weird things happen. And so it was necessary to put a clock control cir circuit together in order to do that. Uh, I'll probably will talk about this in some more detail. It probably deserves its own video because it's maybe more extensive than you think it should be. But for the purposes of this video, what I'm uh, going to show is that I've actually bypassed this. Uh, this right here, I basically take the system clock and route it to the clock net, which has really, well, you, you can see the clock net being input here, but I don't do anything with the output from this clock control. It doesn't go anywhere. So therefore, none of the other circuitry on the design is taking anything from clock out. And as you can see, the CPU is clocked with the clock net as well as you know RAM and this uh, register here. So uh, all that said... What happens when we run this simulation? So I have the frequency set at 16 hertz. So I'm going to go ahead and enable auto tick. And if we scroll over here, this is interesting, but really focus your attention. Uh, the little decimal point is the system clock. So this is running at 16 hertz, or should be. And the uh, value of this register right here Pay attention to this, uh, this LED, this one at the bottom right. That is blinking at a regular interval, which is what I would expect given the application that I just showed you. So what I take from this example is that the CPU is working as I would expect, at least in, under simulation. So here is my FPGA. And I'm going to load the program that we just ran under simulation onto onto this board. And what I want you what I want you to pay attention to again is this this segment of this LED. Uh, this is the segment that should flash, you know, fairly slowly, on and off on regular interval, because the that uh, the register that I showed you uh, that this is the one this is indication that that register the value of it's getting inverted every uh, every time through the loop. And you'll notice it came on once, but it has not come back on again. It's off. And, you know, the decimal point, again, is the clock. It You may see it as sort of flickering in a, a seemingly unregular way, and it's because the frame rate of this camera that I've got is not great. Uh, and so, you know, but in, in real life, the clock is chugging along uh, at, at, a, at a regular interval. But this segment is not flashing like it's supposed to. So obviously, 
the real hardware is not working the way it's supposed to. And the question is, why not? So in order to try to troubleshoot this problem, what I determined was I had to have a way to step the CPU instruction by instruction. So that's really what this clock control circuit is for here. Uh, and so what I want to do is hook it, put it into circuit, and uh, see if we can step through the CPU uh, to identify at least what's not working the way we expect it to work. So what I'm going to do, uh, hook the real clock up to clock in, and then I'm going to hook the output of the clock control to the clock net for the rest of the components on the device. Now, when I do that, this gives me a couple of uh, cool capabilities. So if this switch is in the off position, this is the auto manual switch. And if auto is turned off, that means that the CPU will, will be under step control of this button. So if I start the clock, nothing is going to happen, right? Because auto is turned off. And this gives me the ability to step each one. Oh, if I turn this on, if I, if I, this gives me the ability to step the CPU. And as you can see up here, we advanced to the next instruction. And if I keep pushing this button, uh, if I push it, long enough because you have to hold it down for a bit, you can see the CPU is advancing. So that's pretty nice. That gives me the ability to step the CPU and look at the results of the registers. Uh, I also have the ability with this switch right here, which is not going through clock control by the way, but this switch right here to flip what, what I'm looking at. Am I looking at out M and address M on the output side, or am I looking at the instruction and input memory uh, on the input side? So I have very nice control now over the CPU with this, with this test harness. And of course, if I turn this to auto, then you can see now the CPU will free run like it normally does. And, and again, you can see this LED, this uh, segment C, flashing on and off on a regular basis, which again tells me that the CPU should be working. Let's put this now on the FPGA and see if we can figure out what the problem is. Okay, I have the uh, step design synthesized and loaded into the board now, and uh, you'll notice I have this switch set low, which means the clock is stopped, so nothing's happening, which is what I would expect. So let's... Um, Let's see if we can step through this and find out what the problem is, or at least see what instruction is not executing the way we expect. Uh, I guess before we do that, we let's just run it and see what happens. So again, we should be watching for this LED to come on once uh, like it did before and go off and not do anything. I mean, ultimately it should flash, but it wasn't doing that, so... So it came on, and it's continuing to come on. So is this, is this thing working now? Hmm. So I'm going to stop the clock, and uh, I'm going to restart the board. And just for fun, I'm going to step the CPU one at a time so you can see that work. Um, it's this top button right here. And you can see this, when you see this flash, this decimal point, you know the clock is ticking. And these LEDs up here indicate... Um, I think uh, one is for the right bit on the CPU coming on, and the other one is, and the other one is whether or not we're loading the register that uh, is going to uh, contain the bit that we're trying to flash. So those are of lesser importance, but when you see them flicking, we know we're you know advancing instructions.
Okay, so this is the first time this has come on now. So now it's gone off. And now it comes back on. So the unfortunate thing is, and I haven't stopped to record all of the, you know, all of the intermediate states of each one of the steps that we're doing because I can't repro the problem. The CPU is working as I would expect. So we're going to have to come up with some theories and try some different things. But because we have such a simple program, it actually makes it fairly easy to reason out where the source of the trouble is, not maybe an, a, under, understand the cause, but certainly, you know, we can do some, maybe narrow down the source of the trouble. The very first thing uh, I think to note is that since the LED is not flipping on and off, the only way that that can really happen is if this invert instruction does not work correctly. Um, you know, you could make the argument, well, maybe you don't have the right address, or maybe the register is not toggling, which, yeah, it's true. It could that, that could be a source of the problem. However, we know the address is right, and we know that the register is toggling because, if you'll recall, when it doesn't work, the LED comes on once, and then it never comes on again. So in that way, you know, we know that we have this address right, and we know that the register at least gets updated once. So the the most likely source of the trouble is this instruction right here, where we take m, we, we take the value of m, which is the value at in memory at a at a given address, which is whatever address x is assigned to, and we stick it back in that same memory location. So this this instruction right here is most likely the the cause of the problem, and so. You know, there could be a could be a couple of causes, a couple of questions as to why that might be. One is, is our invert logic working on the ALU? You know, I've looked at that very carefully and ruled that out. If we go back to the simulation, the simulation shows that it's working. So, uh, and given that the ALU is, is not synchronized by the clock, there's no source of trouble that the CPU get, could give, you know, if, if you you present two values to it and you set the control bits, you should see the value instantaneously, the output. And, you know, I've confirmed that the output is what we expect when you negate. I've ruled the ALU out. That can't be it. So what, what else might this be? Well, if you think about what this instruction is doing, this instruction is taking the value that's in memory, altering it, and sticking the result back in the same memory location. And that got me to thinking. This is the this is a data sheet or a white paper from the Arctic 7 FPGA uh, chip, and, which is the chip that's on the Alcatree AU board. And this is specifically talking about memory resources on the board. And it's important to understand that the RAM component, if you haven't watched my prior videos, the RAM component that I have connected to the CPU, uh, this component, this component right here, synthesizes into block RAM on the FPGA. And again, I have another video that where where I where I go into that. And so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna detail how or why that happens, but just suffice it to say that it does happen. And so uh, given that I surmise that this might be memory related or the, you know, the source could be memory related in some way, I decided to go look up for this, this document. So if we scroll down here to the very, very beginning of the document, um, right here, block RAM resources gives you, you know, some information about how block RAM can, can be configured and that's all fine and nice, but this, let me direct your attention to this sentence right here. Similar to Vertex 6 FPGA block RAMs, write and read are synchronous operations. That means that they are synced by the clock. And so 
what does that what does that imply for the CPU design that we have here? Where if you think about the if you think about this operation right here, we're reading from memory, we're negating what we read from memory, and we're trying to write it back into memory. Well, can that all happen in one tick of the clock? And I would argue to you, no, but maybe, right? Uh, does that does that explain, I guess, the inconsistent behavior that 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 we're seeing where it works in simulation, it doesn't work when we wire the clock directly to the circuit on the FPGA, but we can get it to work if we gate the clock through some components. And, and I did not show you the clock control. Maybe that would this would be the opportunity to do that, to just sort of show the fact that the clock is being gated through this clock control component. So let me just open that up and just show you. I'm not gonna explain everything about the clock control, but I will show you Uh, so the clock comes in when it is free run. The only thing that it goes through is this mux right here. But nonetheless, that evidently is enough to cause memory access to be timed in such a way in one clock cycle that it can be read and written to in the same clock cycle. But this document here implies to me that block RAM can't be used in the way that the FPG that that the uh, hack CPU is designed for it to be used, at least from the standpoint of trying to read from memory and write to memory in the same clock cycle. The other thing to note is that this sentence down here, it says during a write operation, the memory can be set to have data output remain unchanged reflect the new data being written or the previous data now being overwritten. So that implies that there's something that can be sent to the configuration of the block RAM at the time of synthesis to enable this behavior to occur. And, and would this make a difference in, in any case? Uh, this is something that I found and thought about after the solution that I'm about to present to you, but I did, I've read this parts of this document now multiple times and noticed this subsequent to what I'm about to show you. And so there may well be a different solution lurking here that may uh, indicate that perhaps Logisim is miscoding the synthesis of the RAM component at least as, as it stands for consistent behavior between how it's simulating and how it's directing synthesis to be directed. But that's still supposition on my part. Um, I don't have any evidence to prove that by altering code, but in any case, suffice it to say, it is worth noting that block RAM can be set up to behave in these three sort of different uh, configurations. So here's another version of the CPU that I have where I've loaded the same program that we saw before. Uh, you, you'll see some differences down here. Really not that important. Just note that the output of this register that should blink is connected to all these LEDs. So, you know, we should see all of these LEDs blink off and on. It's the equivalent of that one seven segment coming off and on. But what's important here is that given that the RAM is synchronous both in reading and writing. It seems to me that when we need a value read from RAM, we need to do a clock cycle in order to get the value of RAM out that we need. And when then when we want a write to occur, of course, that would occur when the instruction says to actually do the write. So reading then would need to be controlled for a clock cycle after we set the address register to a value. So what I decided to do was I decided to look for the load occurring 
on the A register. And in effect, then, I wanted to tick the clock to enable memory to be read while holding off operations for the rest of the CPU. And so that's really what this extra circuitry, this this circuitry down here is not part of the original hack CPU. Uh, and so, but what it what it essentially does is it causes the this read signal to become high for one clock tick if loading A comes high. And you can see this feedback loop, which actually triggers this to go low, the next clocks, the, the next clock signal. Also then, this read M net here goes into the program counter increment control and the deregister load control. And what this, what this has the effect of doing is essentially holding off these registers from operating while this read signal is high. And so what that gives the effect of doing is essentially taking the uh, address output, which again is coming from A. So, so if, if this load is high, a clock tick occurs, and that causes the output of the address to show up on out A, which again comes from the out, or goes to the output address of the CPU. Because RAM is wired to this output address, this next clock tick that ensues causes RAM to be read, and the output of RAM being presented to the input of the CPU for thus the next clock tick, which would presumably be a write, to be able to write whatever the ALU says into memory. So these, you know, these modifications are not part of the hack. You know, this one here, this one here, this one here, and then this circuitry down here. These are not part of the hack specification, but I believe, while not documented in the book, they designed the implementation with the notion of an a, a set of memory that would asynchronously read. So, you know, you set the value and instantaneously the value that's in memory shows up on the output. But that is not the way block RAM works in an FPGA, from, from my understanding. Or at least, maybe better said, doesn't work predictably because obviously it it can be made to work under certain circumstances, but certainly not predictable. At least I wouldn't have predicted that adding a multiplexer in the clock chain would have actually caused this design to suddenly start working. So if we simulate this design, does it work as we expect? So I have the tick frequency again at 16 hertz. So I'm just going to turn on ticking. And we should see this flash on and off regularly, these LEDs, and we do. So the design still works as we, as we would expect under simulation. Although notice that I did um, put an LED connected now to this new read signal that's coming out of the CPU, which by the way, is not connected to anything. It doesn't need to be connected to anything because there's no read signal on this RAM implementation. You know, when you when you present an address and you tick the clock, you get on the output whatever's at that address. But I did put an LED on here just to, to convince myself that the logic that I had of actually doing the read was uh, working correctly. If we synthesize this now, does this work on the real hardware? So here's my board. We're going to load the fixed design and see if that solves the problem. If it's fixed, we should see these LEDs. These are the 16 that are connected to the register. We should see these flash regularly. And we do. So this is telling me that in order for the hex CPU design to work with block RAM on an FPGA that is synchronous both for reads and writes, you've got to put a clock cycle in to do the read of the RAM prior to executing any instruction where you want to do a write.